All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our first uh, our submissions working group meeting for 2023. Um, normally, Joe would be uh, the one speaking here, but I'm going to be filling in in terms of just running the agenda and kicking things off here. Um, but certainly wish Joe a speedy recovery um, on what he's been going through. And um, certainly, if you're watching this, Joe, hopefully after the fact, I do a halfway decent job, but you always do an excellent job of running these. But um First, uh, before we get too much further, we want to introduce um, our one of our newest uh, attendees to this, representing the R Consortium, uh, Luke Shant. So, Luke, why don't you just say a couple of words about yourself, if you don't mind? Yeah, well, thank you, Eric. Uh, hi, my name is Luke. If we haven't met before, I'm the new program manager for the R Consortium. Uh, I also work with the OpenJS Foundation, and uh, you know, I'm I'm attending all the meetings uh, in in the short term, but I'm sure I'll be participating and working with you all in different capacities along the way. Awesome. Well, welcome aboard. And yeah, we're, we're excited to have you join this. Hopefully it will be a very productive year. If last year is any indication, we had a lot of great progress and there's a lot of new ideas and new avenues to pursue uh, this year as well. So, um, so I have a bit of, I've been looking a little bit before the meeting about some of the items we touched on in December that we can talk through. Some of these I think will be more quicker than others, but maybe we'll kick things off um, with uh, maybe an update on some of our attendees from the FDA side with regards to our Pilot 3 uh, Shiny App submission. I know Paul and others, when we last left off, um, it looks like it did go through successfully into the ECTD transfer. But we just want to do a quick check to make sure there weren't any issues on your side that we needed to talk about or any what's your progress on that? Pilot three or pilot two? I'm sorry, pilot two. I'm getting I, I was right wondering there. if I, I was missing something <laughs> there. Yes, yes. Uh, numbers are hard in January. Yes. Uh, okay. Sorry for that. <laughs> so um no, that's okay. Um, no, actually, we were able to um, follow the directions and um, implement the Shiny app. I did it with both the initial directions and the console. Um, I might suggest some more details, kind of outlining um, those instructions a little bit more. Um, okay. But that's more of a um, implementation issue. Okay. Um, so, and I think um, Heisu had some, um, suggestions as well or things to narrate we did and we're still trying to figure it out um i had some weird error messages which if i ignored worked okay so um okay. we're not sure if that's just um a result of how things were being pulled from some of the sites at the time or if that's something that needs to be addressed in the long term. So we'll do a little bit more digging on our side. Yeah, very appreciate that feedback, Paul. And um, certainly I'm happy to consult with on the specifics of what you were seeing as well as, um, you know, as we think about future pilots in this space, especially that are going to evolve shiny or some other, you know, fairly complicated infrastructure. Certainly want to make sure that the instructions are clear and making sure they, you know, get you up and running the right way. So I'd be very happy that you follow up offline, or if you want to put some of your notes on the uh, GitHub repository that we have for the um, submission. Mm -hmm. um, either way is fine with me, whatever um, would be best working for you. Okay, we appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> hey, Sue, do you want to share some of your observations have, or experience i mean hi everyone um happy new year <laughs> first of all um i same thing like i was able to follow the edrg and then um successfully launch the r shiny application um there's no my like major issues but with 
I found some minor issue, er, like error messages and warning messages, but um, I'm trying multiple, um, I'm trying to launch the R Shiny app in different machine, like my prisoner, like scientific laptop and like remote machines so that I can compare um, the result in different situation. Uh, but I got some error message like inconsistently. So I'm, I need more time to um, see what is happening and uh, what's the, what's, why is it causing the issues? So um, I just wanted to give you guys an update on progress that um, we were able to follow the, the ADR, ADRG and then launch the application. Excellent. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. And I've always been, I admit when we did the testing of this, we really targeted the Windows environment as a quote unquote local install as the primary method that um, it seemed like you all would be accessing the application. But I'm very intrigued when you mentioned the different environments, kind of those um, issues you saw, especially for future development. So feel free to share those once you've had a chance to um, consolidate your findings. Sounds great. Thank you. Maybe we can give you more updates on um, February meeting or okay. like yep. off, yeah, offline. Yeah, yeah. Happy to, any way you'd like to share those, we'll be happy to hear it. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Um, so yeah, other than that feedback, did anyone else have any comments or questions on how Pilot 2 has gone? since we last discussed? Okay, I'll take that as we can move right along to um, the real Pilot 3, I should say. Um, and I believe, Joel, you have sent around um, requests for feedback on the proposal. Why don't you give our, our team an update here on the progress on your side? Yeah, thanks, Eric, for the for the time. Yeah, so just a quick update on pilot three. Um, so yeah, the, the proposal was sent out uh, like early December, I believe. Um, and I unfortunately I couldn't get it on the R consortium Git for some reason. My access there wasn't um, able for me to push it there. But it is it is in our pilot three Git. So hopefully everyone does have access there to kind of take a review of our pilot three proposal. Uh, essentially, the proposal again is just kind of to the FDA to ensure that when we package things up, they're able to execute it. Uh, and so it kind of outlines all of the details there. Pretty much the, you know, kind of the same uh, approach that Pilot 1 and Pilot 2 took. Um, so we're, we're hoping to follow that um, and, and see if there's any other feedback, or any other alternatives or, or ways we can get um, on how to submit Pilot 3 since this is more uh, Atom data related. Um, so if, yeah, if, uh, I am seeing some feedback from our pilot three team, but haven't seen too much feedback from other um, other folks from the consortium. So I'll I'll pop it in here, the link to that proposal in our our chat window. Um, hopefully everyone can. Oh yeah, hopefully Eric can pop that into the, the minutes, and then if yes, everyone can access absolutely. that, absolutely, that'd be great. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, looking forward to more feedback on that, so then we can update that as as needed, and um, if final, then we can you know have um a final approach on how we want to submit pilot three. Um, but yeah, so with that though, uh, we're, pilot three is, is ongoing and progress is looking good. Uh, there are the five data set, five Atom data sets that we're focusing on uh, to help generate the TLGs for our, um, yeah, the, the, I think it was just a table and a graph actually from pilot one. Um, so having generated those and drafted those, we're now trying to get the pilot one scripts programs that generated those outputs uh, to see if we can use our atom source data for input into those, those scripts to re-output the, the tables and graph again. Um, we are running into like minor issues with <clears throat> just ensuring that we are kind of using the same define and specifications from like the original CDIS pilot data. And I believe there was an update after the CDIS pilot data with the test data factory repo. Um, and we're 
I'm not too sure which one is truly the, the most up-to-date specs that we should follow for the atom production here. Um, so if anyone has any info on that, uh, that would be great. Otherwise, the, the TDF define is the one that we're using now because per their repo, it seems like they are kind of, they've updated since the CDIS pilot repo has, um, has shared their data sets there. Um, so that's that's one uh, two things, uh, and then lastly, um, since we are you know this this consortium is kind of looking into new ways of submitting to the FDA, um, you know Thomas is always coming up with other ideas as well, and uh, with this submission, there uh, Thomas had just sent me um, a link this morning uh, to a white paper. I guess the Fuse 2017, there's a, a paper that says transport for the next generation. I know traditionally when we submit data sets to the FDA, we we put it uh, or we convert it to XPT format. Um, and with that, I think um, from this paper, it seems like there, there are thoughts on maybe newer ways to, to convert the data other than XPT to submit to the FDA. So. Um, and one of the ways Thomas was thinking was, I guess CDISC is proposing a, a data set JSON file. Um, and so I kind of actually wanted to to know if anyone has any experience or has has seen the this proposal before. Um, there's a, a wiki link to that. Um, <clears throat> and to maybe, dip into your mind a little bit, Paul, to, um, I, I believe this um, this fuse was in collaboration with the FDA as well. Um, if if we can also submit in this data set JSON file instead of XPTs, Paul and Urhisu, um, any? I had heard indirectly that JSON was being proposed um but at this stage i don't know that it's gone anywhere okay um if we look at the let me pull up the study data technical conformance guide Okay. Um, let's see. Hmm. Um, that's annoying. Um, they changed the link around. Let's see if I can pull it. Copy link. Let me put this in. Yikes. Let me not put that in. Um, the uh, Friday the 13th omens are coming true. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's something called the Study Data Technical Conformance Guide. You can Google. My okay. the Google results are yielding some strange um they're echoing it with C disk. Let me just try a different browser um just to see what's going on because usually we can pull it as an FDA link. Um let me see if I can do that quickly. But the study data technical conformance guide spells out the um, latest specs. Is it this one? I, I see one March 2022. There's actually, I think, an October one. Oh, OK. There usually is. Um, and no worries, Paul. I mean, if, if this, this is, is Martin, something... well, okay. 
Ooh, um, I have to find it somewhere. What I'm showing up is the uh, 2018 one, and that's out of date. Um, I'll uh, try to see if I can find the most recent one, but the study data technical conformance guide is updated periodically. Um, it's usually every six months, um, usually March and October. So the that determines what the um, is acceptable to go through the gateway. Got it. And um, how should I say this? I have been at FDA for almost 15 years. Since I have arrived, everyone says XPT is obsolete and should be transitioned out. Um, however, 15 years late, almost 15 years later, we still using XPT. <laughs> Um, all we can say is if someone wants to, they can use the, I think it's version, SAS version 8 XPT, um, and they're not necessarily stuck with the SAS version 5 XPT, which has been the traditional one that's been used. In other words, you can use it, but it's not required. Understood. And are, are you guys seeing more version eight? Or I, guess um, what is, uh, I haven't read up on the differences between five and eight. Um, I think eight will. Ah, uh, here we go. Um, yes. Do you want to post that, Hesu, to the uh, group as a whole? Uh, Hesu sure. is. Uh, Conveniently it, found the March uh, 2022 one. I found the October. Oh, you found the October. Okay. So that's slightly slide update. Um, okay. Oh, is this the right documents that you're looking for? Let me check. Yeah. I opened it on my computer and it does say October 2022. So Lisa does the more. Yeah. So I think so. Day. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. the most recent one that tells you um, all the, essentially, there's a revision history, et cetera. Um, but it does say what's actually required. And on page six of this guide, Yeah. It does say um version five. Mm -hmm. It's the file format. Um so <clears throat> you know they, they will accept some later versions. Apparently they can't re require. I see. Understood. Thank you, Paul, for the the latest guidance then we'll um we'll try to stick with the requirements um but yeah looking forward to see if we can you know maybe try some of the, the newer the newer um ways to transport um, right i think it I would mean, be in the long term it would be advisable um we can say and higher pardon me oh sorry i just saw uh, a chat from Doug. Um, okay. And higher. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the, the systems, as far as I know, there, there have been several pilots attempt to um, look at an alternatives to XPT. Yeah. And so far, none of the pilots have been entirely satisfactory. I see. Um, I see. I, so that we're still kind of stuck with um, 
the current situation with export files. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's good information to know. I yeah, I think one of the things that I mean the limitations of XPT now is like the um was it the variable length names are like still stuck at eight labels at forty, and then the two hundred limit character. Um, so just wanted to see if um, other alternates alternates to XPT could you know could be viable. I yeah. think the later versions expand those a little bit, but don't. I'm not a hundred percent positive. So, um, yeah, I, it is a, um, there is ongoing discussion. Let's just put it that way. Um, I don't know that anyone has a complete solution that will cover all possible cases. Um, so JSON's one possible source. Um, essentially what many people do when they first get the data sets is they convert it to an easier to use format. Right. Um, On your end, just saying when, when you when you guys receive it and you'll just convert it to something you're used to, I guess, so to speak, or easier to work with. Um, correct. Even X, um, even if you want to use it in SAS, you have to f really first convert it to a standard SAS data set. True. True. Um, so that conversion has to occur. Um, One could, when in some cases, some you can be converted to an R data set. Um, and I have seen it, although I don't necessarily recommend um, our CSV files for data conversion. Um, the, the problem there is that people might try to open it said csv files in excel yeah um and um i noticed eric is smiling um i've i've seen the pain that can happen in that in that case <laughs> yes so um given that that's the case um there are some issues of interest, but yeah. Appreciate your feedback, Paul. Yeah, no, no worries. I mean, I, I think maybe for pilot three, we can we can follow the uh, the technical guidance here that you've provided. Thank you for, for reminding us of that. So yeah, we could, you know, maybe this could be a pilot four or five, <laughs> just alternate transports, also XBT. But, but yeah, thanks for just kind of having this discussion. I think it's helpful. Yeah. Um, right now, until we hear otherwise, um, we we have to go with the findings or the um, guidance provided in the study data um, guidances. Understood. Understood. Yeah, at least from my perspective, just observing this, uh, I feel like we should keep a close eye on the JSON format progress as I think that will, now again, this is Eric's opinion here, so feel free mm -hmm. to challenge, but <laughs> it is probably the best balance of modern yet um, accessible enough that in the different computing languages that we would use to consume these results, we would have fairly a fairly easy time of getting this into the rectangular format that we're used to when we actually look at the clinical data. So obviously R has 
many packages that go from JSON to our data frames. I'm sure SAS has routines that probably could handle it because of some of their modern tooling that they're, you know, marketing in their in their product pipeline. That's just again speculation at this point. Mm -hmm. But I would hate to reinvent the wheel if that effort does actually pan out. I, mm -hmm. I, I definitely hear what you're saying, yes. Paul. I think there have been attempts at this that have had mixed results at best. And, you know, maybe this is the more promising one that can at least be imported successfully in these packages or these software. Um, and frankly, the modern software development world, JSON is like the ubiquitous language to go back and mm -hmm. forth between client and server-side operations and the like, but that's a whole... Another mm -hmm. discussion topic mm -hmm. for another day. Yep. Um, this has been, uh, I, I participated in that exporter, or not exporter, uh, data set JSON um, hackathon that COSA, the CDIS Open Source Alliance, put on. I mean, maybe um, Pilot 4 could be working with like Sam Hume and the COSA people to do a submission with data set JSON as like a, or a continuation of Pilot 3 to see if you could push push things along a little bit just as an just as an idea for a pilot four or pilot five from yeah, mark for sure. yeah. mm -hmm. i think it's not a bad idea it's just um i don't know that the gateway is even set up to allow for json submissions hmm. excellent point so until the gateway is set up to enable um, those items, um, we might wa not want to go down that path. Um, that would be a discussion with the um, eData team at FDA. Um, and in the past, we've had Ethan Chen and some of his folks participate in this meeting. Yeah, so that could be an action for a uh, future agenda topic to bring, yeah, maybe someone like from their team on exploring that as a possibility. I do agree that definitely warrants probably its own pie when instead of trying to merge that with pie with three, because I'm afraid that with the discussions involved and the change that will likely need to occur, we wouldn't want to slow down Pilot 3's progress for, for that piece if it ends up being a very iterative thing. That's just my opinion, but um, Joel, I don't know if you agree with that or if you want to think more about it. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to me. I mean, yeah, if, if Paul's saying the, the gateway is not open to it yet, then, you know, we it, it doesn't make sense to work on it at risk right now. We can always extend it once we we have word of of you know have it being you know receivable by the fda but yeah so yeah well you know once pilot three is done we'll we'll, we'll follow xpt for now um but then once once it opens up we'll we can reopen pilot three to extend it to then convert to json and then resubmit again I'm thinking that could probably be the easier route instead of a whole new pilot or package um, since it's just data conversions, really. Yeah, that's a similar mindset as I have when I think about the container pilot, whatever number that ends up being. We're just going to basically reuse the shiny app we did in pilot two and not try to reinvent too much at once, just yeah. to yeah. isolate the key, the key points that need change. So sounds uh, good. All right. Well, thank you, Joel, for that great update and the great discussion. I took a lot of notes for that for the minutes. So I appreciate look out for that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I'll try to keep up as best I can. But as always, when I send those out, if there are any corrections, it's all in the GitHub repo and you feel free to correct those. Um, well, I'm glad you're recording it too. I may have forget what I said. Yeah, you and me both. Yep. <laughs> so um, I'd like to move on for the sake of time. Um, Doug had proposed that in this meeting, we have a nice um, introduction to the repositories working group and some of the progress and efforts going on in that space. So um, Doug, I can turn it over to you if you'd like to kick that off. Cool. Yeah. Um, for anyone who's not aware, we've had uh, we've launched a new working group under the R validation hub um, that's looking at what a 
um, shared source for packages might look like. Um, and so we just wanted to do uh, kind of an intro session just to kind of introduce our team and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think that there's a lot of you know, parallels between what our teams are trying to do. So um, just to kind of set that groundwork so that if there are places where we can help each other out, um, we can kind of be in touch from the start. Um, so I have a couple of slides prepared. They're pretty like bare bones, but um, I'll run through those. And then we can just kind of have a discussion around, um, you know, what, what we might see as, um, you know, the next steps for this kind of thing. So let me see if I can share from Zoom, hopefully this works. Can you, can someone confirm that you guys are seeing my slides? I'm looking good, Doug. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so um, we have a few people on the call representing the team. I think I saw Kevin and Andrew also uh, in the room. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, this is um, a group starting to look at like, what would it, what would it be? What would it, what would it look like to have a, a regulatory ready repository? Um, and I, I want to kind of leave the repository word. I want to harp on that too much because they're still kind of like open-ended about exactly what, what this product ends up looking like. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but to start, I just want to start with like what our mission is, why we're, why we're looking into this problem um, and what exactly the problem is. Um, so what we're hoping to do is support a transparent, open, dynamic, cross-industry approach to establishing and maintaining a repository of our packages um, with accompanying evidence of their quality and assessment criteria. Um, and so in a lot of ways, like we, we have CRAN already, which is like a pretty phenomenal resource that already kind of sets a, a bar for package quality. Um, but as I'm sure like everyone on the, this call is aware, we have a lot of internal um, company specific process that then kind of gets bundled on top of that to document this evidence and make it more reproducible and accessible um, if we ever have to kind of like show that um, that level of quality. And um, if you've gone through this process in your own company, um, or if you can get just kind of imagine what that looks like, um, internally, you know, at Acme Co over here, um, they might be taking a look at, you know, the hundreds of packages that you might need to perform a clinical analysis. And everyone might decide that those all look great. Um, and then you go to do your submission, you know, like years later, um, or maybe there's like some kind of um, interim uh, reporting event or something like that. And that's really your only opportunity to get a really direct feedback on like what, what, whether this level of quality is um, sufficient. And so if there's like really major concerns about how you're performing analysis or the, your choice of packages or things like that, that's kind of, you kind of get those more at the tail end of your process. Um, and um, in general, I haven't heard of a lot of situations where that's like been a major concern, but it, it, you know, it does kind of push a lot of this decision making um, toward the tail end, which kind of makes a really long feedback loop and leaves a lot of uncertainty on the table throughout the whole analysis process. So what we'd like to do is have this be a more like open dialogue. So instead of having this like long delay before you get feedback, um, this is something where, first of all, all companies have uh, you know, transparent access to this shared kind of collective body of knowledge about what level of quality we feel each of these packages has. And then on the regulator side, we hope that this kind of opens up a forum for having a more kind of transparent dialogue about which packages um, we don't think hold up to some level of quality or might have uh, like methods that might have kind of like implementations that might not be up to our standards or something like that so that if we get that feedback earlier, we can feed it back into like the open source community and hopefully improve those packages to the point where people are happy with them. Um, and like I mentioned, this, uh, this idea of a repository, you might be thinking of something like CRAN, um, but we're not, we're not exactly fixated on that idea. Um, it could be something like CRAN where we have some additional like um, quality assessment um, considerations baked into it. Um, it could be something like our universe, which has a really awesome product, um, you know, for like just producing a cohort of more curated packages. Um, or it could be something like, uh, you know, going to Ikea and you pull off the shelf, just like uh, a set of instructions for producing a regulatory ready environment with a, you know, a curated set of packages that we've decided are of good quality. So uh, we're, we're not exactly sure what this is going to look like. And that's largely why we're, we're here is to start thinking about how do we start answering the questions about what's really needed 
before we jump into a technical solution. So um, just to kind of get cut to the chase, um, for anyone representing the regulatory end of things, uh, we want to understand how you observe quality and um, get a better idea of what we can do upfront to showcase that quality so that it's not a mystery to us whether or not that's going to be something that um, you're interested in, in us using for analysis. And then if you're an industry participant, um, what we're looking for is support in helping to kind of like draft these things um, or intermittent feedback if you just want to kind of look at what we're producing and um, understand whether that would work for you and your company or whether you just think that um, given your experience with um, interactions with health authorities, if that's something that would support that process. So anywhere where we can like leverage feedback, that's really where we're looking for the most input right now. And um, just to kind of paint a little bit of a picture of what we're planning to deliver initially. Um, like I said, we don't want to jump straight to implementing something on a technical scale. Um, you know, invest a lot of time and effort into building something before you really understand what the need is. Um, so from the start, it's some, it could be as something as simple as just like mapping out the various quality heuristics that we could um, possibly surface in something like a shared resource um, so that we all have the same kind of like understanding of the level of quality of the software. So um, if we were thinking, of, if I was framing this in the context of a submission pilot, um, you know, this pilot really just could be a survey um, of like, if we had this information about download counts um, or, um, you know, test coverage, um, how is that perceived and what else would you be looking for? So just starting to have those, those conversations um, would really help us make sure that we're heading off on the right path. Um, from there, we were thinking having something like a mock-up of um, a portal would help to kind of make it a little more tangible. So it's not just a checklist, but rather something where you're, you're kind of getting a little bit of a, a impression for what it would look like to inspect that for each package. And um, if we were then thinking into the further future, um, if we wanted to put together a pilot where we hope to host these packages in a way that could be consumed by a health authority in, one, in a pilot, um, we could spin up something like a static package server, um, if that's a direction that we end up paying in, so that you could pull packages from an endpoint similar to CRAN, but that's more controlled, um, just so that we could see what that kind of like technical feasibility would look like. So I think that's my last slide, um, pretty short. Um, but hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of where we're at right now and what our goals are. And um, yeah, like I said, I really want to leave the majority of the time for discussion. So if um, people think have any impressions on the path that we're on and um, think that we could be doing things differently or want to be involved, we're very interested in hearing that. So I can leave it there and open it up the floor. So Doug, in terms of how the group is structured, uh, like how often are you meeting and what, what's the cadence for, um, you know, the collaboration within your group right now? Yeah, yeah. Um, so right now we meet about once every two to three weeks. Um, it's a little ad hoc at the moment because we just kind of passed this holiday period and we just sure. moved off in November. Yeah. Um, so um, things are still like kind of settling themselves. Um, we have people split up into three different groups where we have kind of like people that want to be more industry reps um, that are really here from like an ideation perspective, just trying to make sure that we're hitting the right mark. Um, we have people that want to be involved technically, you know, spin something up on, on a technical, technical solution. And then we have people that are more organizing. So um, just trying to coordinate all the different efforts. So if, if anyone feels like passionate about any of those different um, paths, then we can use your help. Um, and certainly on the like health authority side, um, thinking about what you guys would be receptive to, um, to giving feedback on would also really help us um, kind of understand what we should be delivering in this early part of this um, initiative. Um, if there aren't any like, you know, if that didn't, um, prompt any kind of initial impressions that we can I, always... I have one. Um, okay. You know, I was Take just waiting away. for others to chime in. I didn't want to dominate the conversation, but um, 
Well, is there overlap or synergies with what's been done in the R validation hub with say the risk metric, you know, effort? Um, is that going to be like a component of this or how do you think that fits into play here? Yeah, totally. So um, I've been biting my tongue trying not to like really bury the lead with risk metric, but I think that could be um, a really fruitful resource for us to start surfacing some of these metrics. Um, but there's, I mean, there's, there's these types of tools um, all over the R world for doing this kind of like quality um, assessment. So I think on the risk metric side, we try to be really exhaustive. I was really involved with risk metric before yes. we kicked this off. So I'm very aware of like the, the breadth of things that we can assess on the risk metric side. Um, and it was really built with the kind of like internal use case in mind. So if we, depending on what this looks like for um, what a um, shared collection of packages might amount to, if it ends up being something that's like automated, um, then it might be, you might be expecting different things from what we would run with risk metric. Um, but if it ends up being something that's more like, how do we take what we would have assessed internally and just make that public, then maybe risk metric is a really good resource for that. So, I mean, we'll use the right tool for the, for the job and risk metric is certainly among uh, the strong contenders for providing a lot of that great tooling. So maybe there'll be a lot of synergy there. Yeah, well, there was a good nuance you shared there. This is not just about when a company is or a sponsor is assessing which packages to use for a clinical deliverable and then getting that, the convenience of risk metric for their input. This is also looking at cross industry or cross partnership, cross of HTA health authorities. So I can see why this is could be bigger than just what risk metric offers, but it could still be a, a key piece to this. Um, yeah, certainly I'm intrigued by where this goes. So um, if someone does want to get involved, is it just contact you or what's the best way? to? Yeah, I'll, I'll drop a link. We have a repository that where we do all most of our discussion. So okay. um, we have a sign up issue that's pinned there. So you can just Great. like message there and we'll get, we'll get you added to meetings and stuff like that. Um, and from there, we can start. Um, yeah, primarily we want the the all, as much of the work to be async as possible. So even just jumping in and starting to express opinions on issues is probably the best way to start. Um, so yeah, definitely get involved if there's um, any interest. And I'll also say that like there's there's other peripheral elements to this as well. So the within the R consortium, there's also a repositories working group that's thinking about how do we improve like the um, transparency of CRAN. So um, if we do end up going down that path, then I think there's a lot of synergy there um, to start saying, you know, working with that team to figure out what are these kind of like core quality measures that we want to see. And is that something that might be um, in the future for just like a agnostic repository? Um, I think that's that's some pretty, pretty big thinking for the early start. And I'm not sure that, um, you know, that's necessarily where things will go, but I think that would also be super cool. So there's, a lot of different avenues that this could take. Yeah, definitely. I was thinking about that, those efforts as you were talking through, but one of the points you made earlier and your overview is the idea of transparency. I think as long as that is at the forefront of like how, how say these metrics or these quality assessments are performed, you know, where is the latest updates, what's changed maybe in from like a month or a previous release of a package to now, um, I think that if as long as you adhere to or the group adheres to those principles, I think this has a lot of promise. So certainly um, feel free to drop a link to the repo in the chat. I'll be able to throw that in the minutes um, when we send this out for people to get involved. But it does sound really promising. Cool. And if I can maybe just um, pose like one targeted question at the, the FDA folks, um, it's the what I was proposing like this, um, maybe like um, list of quality measures that we might be able to um, include as something like a quality report for a package. Is that something that you would be able to give feedback on? Um, do we have the right people in contact in contact with us to be able to like make that kind of a um, just kind of first pass? It doesn't even to be, need to be like a official FDA opinion, but just getting some like general ideas around what that would look like. Are, are those people uh, attending these meetings or do we have the right kind of like connections to get that type of feedback? Um, those people don't really exist. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's also good feedback. 
Um, so what would it take then to start um, just forming some kind of consensus around what, what measures of quality you guys might be looking for? <clears throat> I don't, um, how should I preface this? Um, there are certain issues that um, the biggest concerns are probably that FDA IT has are around security. Um, okay. You know, where are there any things that will potentially compromise the system? So I, I one instance that I've seen cited, and I don't know to what extent it exists, um, is Haven supposedly can you can run into buffer overflow issues. But I've used Haven without problems for at least a couple of years and not run into those issues. So yeah. how big of an issue is it? I don't know. Um, so there are some things like that that um, would be of potential concern. Um, and that's more with the security folks. Um, as far as I know, there is no real attempt made to independently gauge the quality of a um, R package. Um, I mean, basically what we've been pointing people towards is the R validation hub. Okay. You know, basically saying, look, if you're, if this is a concern, here's, it's not perfect. You know, it's not doing an independent replication of the algorithms, but um, this is a reasonable stab at the right direction. Um, so to that extent, um, that's the primary aspect. Um, the fallback position is essentially if you look at the every splash screen of every computer program, um, it seems essentially you're, you're using as is software. Mm -hmm. There are no, you know, even software that companies tout as being validated and tested. If you read the splash screen, you know, it's, you're using as is, there is no implied guarantee of quality. Um, I mean, that, that's the cynic of me says, nobody is guaranteeing quality at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think, I mean, guaranteeing quality is definitely a high bar. So um, trying to reach that, I think is going to be, I'm not sure that that's, realistic in the, especially in the context of something like R where the, the landscape is so vast. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is think about like, what, what qualities can we put out there that at least give us like a reasonable level of confidence um, mm -hmm. and um, some consistency to, you know, some kind of like heuristic that we use just for measuring package quality that would at least give us like a baseline. So there, I'm not saying that we're going to like eliminate every situation where Haven might be able to encounter a buffer overflow or, you know, whatever it is, things like that, I think are um, probably going to be unrealistic for us to try to catch in all cases um, or even most cases, if, if just for the potential of those types of issues. Um, but what we can do is form that like central forum for expressing these things so that when mm -hmm. you identify that like, uh, you know, there's a buffer overflow issue in Haven, we can maybe have a way to 
record that in a central place so that that becomes a, a priority for like pharmaceutical companies if they need this package um, you know contributing that fix becomes a priority for them um, because otherwise it's going to be a bottleneck for their submission process so mm -hmm. um, if we can do that then and at least make it more transparent i think that's really the ultimate goal so maybe we can what i think would be um great is if we i mean i've already learned a lot about like where your priorities are in terms of assessing these things so if we can put together just um, like a list of what this might look like, I think, again, even just like broad strokes feedback about it um, okay. would really kind of help us set that direction. I have a so. question too. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Um, I, I feel like every conference I go to always has talks about this kind of topic, like validation. Uh, risk assessment. I, I don't know if there's a way to, in what you're doing, kind of correlate all those efforts. Just, I, I don't know. I just hear a lot about auto validator. I think that you guys at Roche have, yeah. um, like a GSK, we have our own validation process now that I think has been talked about at some conferences. It's just like a little, I, I know we're trying to converge <clears throat> to something that all the pharma companies can can use, but I guess I get kind of confused about what what is all the hot topics right now. And it seems like there's always these tools out there to show you like the change log between the different packages, the risk metrics of the different packages. Like, you know, like <clears throat> if things are, if, the, if there are tools that are out there and they're like actively being updated and maintained, you know, like that, that, could, that would be good to see in a list as well as like kind of, you know, different topics that have, have been discussed at different conferences about the companies using validation processes and it'd yeah. be helpful for me because when people talk about this, it seems like it's always the same. It's a similar topic every, every time and we're getting yeah. there. I, I'm feeling positive about it. I just sort of, uh, um, I get confused <laughs> about which one is the hot, hot one right now. Yeah. 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 I, I feel that as well. Um, so actually one, one of the things I didn't kind of give this history lean into this, um, just in the interest of time, but, um, the valid, the, our validation hub just recently this past year ran a series of, um, case studies where we have, we've had like, I think eight different companies, um, share their internal validation process. Um, so, and we put out a white paper after that, um, that tried to find the consistencies between all of those and the. Um, differences among them. So uh, we do have those resources to try to standardize a little bit, but those are still kind of like operating under, under this assumption that we're all internally doing enough, um, which is is kind of like this unpleasant, like looming fear that there might be something else that we should be doing, or maybe we're doing too much and we're just like bogging down a process for no reason. Um, so that Ultimately, this is now trying to like kick off this dialogue um, with health authorities instead of just being assumptive about what's necessary and um, pairing that list back or bolstering it with other things to make sure that it's hitting these notes that health authorities are looking for. And, uh, that white paper is just on the our, our validation hub. Um, let me, I'll, I'll share a link with Eric um, after the call. I need to look it up where it was published. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd be very, I'd be very interested in that. Yeah, can do. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think, I think that's all the time we need. I know we went a little over Eric, so I don't know if you had other oh. agenda items, but. Um, oh, this, um, this worked perfect for me. Uh, this was kind of the last major item because I don't have a whole lot to share yet on the container pie, whatever number that ends up being. I haven't had a chance to do a lot of digging just yet. So not a whole lot on that. Um, but I'll, with the time we have left for a few minutes, um, anyone else have any questions or comments about these various efforts or other things going forward? I do have a question on the website for this group. Yes. Um, I noticed, uh, I, I'm helping out uh, Joel with the pilot three and I noticed ours is get, isn't updated. Is it, can I do like a PR to get it updated? Like just with some loose language about what we're trying to do? Yeah, certainly I'd welcome that. And um, 
I'm going to try and refactor that site in some a little easier to maintain. In fact, I have my eyes on doing a quarter site out of it. So certainly feel free to send me whatever notes you have about um, the effort description, and I'll at least get it updated in the current format. But look for that site to be a little bit different in the coming months because I want to make that a bit easier for both Joe and, and I to maintain going forward. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. All right, other uh, questions or comments before we wrap it up? All right. Um, to the new year. And, uh, yes, yeah, yes, thanks, absolutely. Everybody. Great to see you all for the new year. And like I said, I think we got a lot of exciting efforts underway and certainly we'll be keeping in touch regularly. So um, hope you all have an awesome weekend and um, we'll see you back in February. Hey, Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yep, thanks, bye -bye. everybody.